The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves under the principle of freedom so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, none of us really live in a bubble, and there are things going on around us, and certain things that interest me that may not interest you, but that doesn't matter. I'm going to talk about what interests me. I'm the speaker. But uh, we had... a. Uh, within politics, which I follow, sometimes just for fun. I know that Jesus Christ controls history, and I'll be talking about this somewhat as we move through the book of Acts, but I'm seeing a lot of things going on in this country that have never happened before, both awful and also some things that may provide hope. And I'm not talking about the hope that can be provided by a politician. I've got an article here that I'll read to you that will deal with uh, what's upcoming in our nation's history. Now, first of all, sh uh, shockingly, if you watch anything about politics, a man named Herman Cain won the straw poll in Florida, and then uh, Zogby came out with a poll that showed Herman Cain far ahead of all of the other Republican candidates who are vying for the presidency. And uh, just out of curiosity, I don't know much about Herman Cain, but out of curiosity, I decided to look up some of his quotes, and so I thought I would read them to you. Now, this is not an endorsement of Herman Cain or any politician. I don't do that as a pastor. I do things simply as an illustration, or simply to be informative. And as we begin to start uh, digging into the Word of God, I start off with a little bit of things to where you can relax a bit before we get to the point to where I am bashing on your toes and making you angry. So, here are some of Herman Cain's quotes. Uh, here's one of them. Americans need accurate information in order to consider Social Security reform. Too bad the media can't be counted on to provide it. Check, I agree. Here's another one. I didn't know I was a conservative when it didn't matter to me growing up. Well, that makes sense. Here's one. And it has to do with the background of Herman Cain and how he went from a hard worker to now actually running for president and possibly even having a shot at it. He states, I started at Pillsbury as a manager in one of their analyst functions, then worked my way up the corporate ladder to become vice president. Moving to Burger King was an important moment in my career. Average American. You see, one of the things that we've been doing as Americans, we've been electing Ivy League type snobbish presidents, Republican and Democrat, ever since 1988. George H. Bush went to a prestigious school Bill Clinton went to a prestigious school. Barack Obama, even George Bush, went to a prestigious school. 
Before that, there wasn't that type of camaraderie. You could, now, and ever since 1988, you would think, the only way I'll ever be president is if I'm smart enough and I have enough money to go to Yale Law School, etc. Wrong. That has only been a recent event in American history, and I, and you can see the result. All that nonsense they teach in, in college is worthless because Princeton, which used to be a theological seminary, and all the other uh, great colleges, which used to be theological seminaries, are now merely teaching satanic doctrine. So here we have a man running for president, started at Pillsbury as a manager. He worked real hard. He moved up the corporate ladder. He became vice president. And then he says moving to Burger King was an important moment in my career. Some of you may laugh at that, but there's nothing funny about it. It's the American dream. Going from the bottom to the top. Knowing that you can move through social strata. In most countries of the world, if you're born poor, you die poor. Not in America. Here's another one. I'm not a professional politician. I'm a professional problem solver. And I believe we should cut the salaries of senators and congressmen 10% until they balance the budget. I call that conservative common sense. Another quote. If the world market believed that we were serious about energy independence and we were going to utilize all of our own existing resources, the speculators would stop speculating up. They start speculating down as we get our own oil out of the ground. And he's using a bit of poetry. And what he's saying is, you see, people make the argument that if uh, a president were to come out and say, all right, all of you have free reign to drill in the Gulf of Mexico and to drill where you need to drill. You can drill in my backyard if you want. You can drill behind the White House. You can drill all around the Washington Monument, which is about to fall over. You can do whatever you want. Just start drilling. And guess what? And they say, well, you know, even if that happened, it would take so long for the oil to actually come into the market that the price wouldn't come down. Wrong! They don't understand capitalism. In capitalism, you always look forward, not backwards, and you don't look day to day. In capitalism, you think about what's going to happen in the future. You don't know, but you try to make a speculation. And if a president comes up and says, drill here, drill now, Drill, baby, drill, as Sarah Palin said. If she were president and she said that, the speculators would run right out of the oil market and oil would crash in terms of its price just because they know it's going to happen and they know it's going to get cheaper anyway. Now, some of these things you say, this is economics. I don't want to hear about that. I want to hear about the word of God. Look, capitalism is the word of God. God created it. And we are in serious trouble in this country because people don't want to think. They're lazy. My pastor, he he talked about all different types of things and would tie it into doctrine, and I'll tie this into doctrine. But he was my greatest teacher ever. And I don't mean just with Bible doctrine. I learned more about history. I learned more about the Jews. I learned more about ancient history. I learned more about sports. I learned more about life in general than I ever did going to school or college. And that's because 
We're not an island unto ourselves. And yes, I could just have just went in and started teaching the verses and that would be fine. And you would learn something. But we are human beings. We need a context. We have a frame of reference. And if I were to start teaching about what was going on during the time of Peter, your frame of reference doesn't match up with that because we live in totally different times. So I have to interlink and try to bring it all to the surface as to, well, Bible doctrine is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And I have to communicate it in such a way that it corresponds with your frame of reference. Now, here's another quote from him. In order to fix Social Security, we must restructure it so that we continue to provide for our nation's seniors that are approaching re retirement age, but allow for younger taxpayers, me, to invest a portion of their Social Security taxes in private accounts. I love that idea. Because everyone in my generation knows there's not going to be a Social Security check waiting for us. And we know it. I talk to people in my generation all the time. We know it. We've accepted it. We know that we're either going to have to save our own money or just be poor. We already know it. Then he says in another quote, It's time to get real, folks. Hope and change ain't working. Hope and change is not a solution. Hope and change is not a job. Well, ain't that the truth? Here's one. Most of the people who are elect, who are in elective office in Washington, Washington D.C., they have held pub, public office before. How's that working for you? My motivation for running for Senate was not for the stature of being a senator, but because I wanted to make a difference on issues I feel passionate about. Right motivation. And that's what we've been talking about in Acts. And there will be several, several passages in Acts that deal with proper motivation. What motivates you? Now, Herman Cain, as I read some of what he writes here in his quotes, he sounds much more like a statesman than a politician. A politician's all out for himself like a lawyer, and that's why most politicians are lawyers, all out for themselves. But here's a guy who gives his motivation. I ran for Senate. Because I wanted to, as it were, what he's saying, move back to the way it was in the past, to where Americans lived in freedom. He wasn't seeking the office of senator to be power mad. And I don't understand that, that area of the old sin nature, but there are a ton of people who have it. Power mad people. Wanting to tell people what to do and how to do it. And if they don't do, and if that person rejects what you tell them to do, then you become obnoxious and you want to uh, gossip malign and judge or whatnot against the person who says, you're not my boss. If you are power mad, you need to go back to the essentials and listen to them for five years straight over and over. And I'm serious. There is, you're off. You're way off. That power lust has to go. Then he says this. Nobody motivates today's workers. 
If it doesn't come from within, it doesn't come. Fun helps remove the barriers that allow people to motivate themselves. Here he's talking about leadership, but at the first part of it, when he's talking about individual volition and individual motivation, this guy's smart. He might not look like much to you. This guy is very smart, and he's infinitely smarter than the group we got up there today. Nobody motivates today's workers. And he's not saying that's bad or good, but then he says, if it doesn't come from within, it doesn't come. Well, that's your spiritual life. He's talking about politics. I'll bring it over into the spiritual life. If it doesn't come from within, it's worthless. You have to be motivated on your own. You have to be positive toward the word on your own. You have to rebound, be filled with the spirit. You have to move on and grow in grace and in knowledge. Utilize the four stages of the faith rest drill. Move through grace and doctrinal orientation. Break through that a door of confidence into a personal sense of destiny. Get to the point to where you have personal love for God and impersonal love for all mankind. Plus H, sharing the happiness of God. And finally, occupation with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now those are the 10 problem solving devices. And for you to follow those, that comes from within. For you to follow the two power options, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, plus Operation Z, which means the metabolization of Bible doctrine from gnosis, academic knowledge, to epinosis, beyond knowledge. All of that comes from within. Now, I, as a pastor, preaching impersonally, I don't make an issue out of a person directly. You may think I'm making an issue out of you, but I'm not. And if I ever do, I've slipped up, but I usually avoid that. And when I'm teaching, I'm usually not thinking about those things. There's far too much else to think about than you or anyone else who thinks that I'm talking about them. Of course you think I'm talking about you. Sometimes I think I'm talking about me. You might not know it, but I've come across some passages and I stop and I say, should I say that? That's about me. And then I say it. Of course I should say it. It's about me. I'll say it anyway. I need to learn it too. And I'm telling the truth about that. I've come across passages and I've been uh, teaching the word of God, yelling and shouting. Then I got to a part about me and I read it and I thought, oops, that's me. I'm going to step on my own toes. I'm going to get mad at myself. No, no, that doesn't. I'm joking. That doesn't happen. But uh, it is an exhortation to me. I'm not perfect. Never said I was. So if it doesn't come within, it doesn't come. And then he talks about uh, the workplace and leadership. And he said, Fun helps remove the barriers that allow people to motivate themselves. In other words, a relaxed mental attitude, and it's very obvious that he has one. He is very witty. He can come up with a, uh, he can come, he smiles. He has a very pleasant personality. And he can come up with a, a quip and a hurry. So he doesn't even have to look at a teleprompter to come up with those things. And uh, compared to Herman Cain, the teleprompter's retarded. Herman Cain can now think a computer teleprompter, or whoever's writing on that thing. Man, you put Herman Cain up against, uh, never mind. I'm not going to make this about politics. I'm not endorsing a candidate. I'm just giving you some principles from a man who seems to have some principles. Whether he's a believer, I don't know. He probably is, but I don't know. But he has principles. Napoleon Bonaparte had principles, and he was not a believer. 
As far as I know, Herman Cain's a believer, but he fo he follows these principles, and at least he knows something about some divine establishment. But I'm not endorsing him for president, and I'm not telling you that because you listen to me and I'm talking about this part particular politician this day that you need to run out and support the guy and put signs out in your yard for the guy wrong. If you're going to do anything, make a pamphlet concerning the gospel of Christ and pass it around. That's far more effective than putting up the name of some man. We don't worship men here. We worship the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, some there are believers who get so wrapped up into politics that they will take their signs and they will post them all around the neighborhood and they will try to promote their candidate as much as possible. And how many times have they tried to tell the world about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for them? Now that's where I'm moving. And I'm getting more excited day by day. In fact, I've never felt more excited in my life. I'm, I'm being serious. I, uh, it's almost as if I see a light at the end, of, at the end of the tunnel, at the end of all the testing. I'm seeing some things that I didn't see before. And I'm getting excited. I'm excited about the Word of God. And I'm excited about those who are going to respond. They already are. I'm not going to give you numbers because I just told you numbers don't matter. But this will begin to grow at least exponentially somewhat. And I've been reading some certain things about what's been going on in Ohio that is absolutely exciting. It made national news. And from what I'm reading and from, I'm, and from what I'm putting together, I'm the only person in Ohio who's going to teach Bible doctrine daily. I don't know of anyone else doing that. And in fact, I would put money on it because I am a gambler. Now, here's something else he said. Nobody motivates, well, we just did that one. Here's one. One right decision doth not a great president make? That's right. There are so many decisions that we have to make in life. One good decision does not make you a great president nor a great person. Here's another one. People who, obo people who oppose Obama are said to be racist. So I guess I'm a racist. Now, Herman Cain is a black man, so that's funny. Nobody laughed. Somebody snored, but nobody laughed. It is late. I have to do these things late because I work second shift, and I'm so excited i got to just keep going anyway. Here's something. Spending time at the Federal Reserve was a good learning opportunity for me. It helped me to understand economic philosophies and policies that I had not previously known about. So there's some humility. He's learning something. And here's something that he says that I really like to hear because you're not pulling any punches. There are so many people who want to hear such fluffy language. It, it drives me sick and insane. Why can't you talk normal just like you do to everyone else? I mean, if you get in a workplace around a bunch of women who think that, uh, who have their own set of standards for others, but a different set, set of standards for themselves, and they will uh, talk terribly about their husbands, they will cuss and run everybody down, but then when they get around their friends, it's all sweetness and light. Well, guess what? That's hypocrisy. And uh, the and uh, women oftentimes are turned off by some type of authoritative statement, especially nowadays. And men are too. And that's because most people in America have become arrogant. But there's going to be a change. But this is what he said. Stupid people are ruining America. 
Amen. There's two more quotes here before I continue. The one thing that the president can do is to establish a real energy independence plan. We have all the resources we need right here in this country to establish energy independence if only we had the leadership. Amen. And then the last one. The past several months I have been able to meet with people across the country. One thing is clear. America craves for real solutions to the problems we face. That's why I'm running for President of the United States. Now these are quotes from Herman Cain. And he seems to be very principled. But then again, I will never ever endorse a candidate because... Everyone has an ults in nature and everyone has flaws and people change. One thing Billy Graham did that was a terrible mistake is he endorsed Richard Nixon and we know what happened to Richard Nixon. And I'm just not going to endorse anyone. I am just linking up biblical principles and divine establishment principles with what was being said by Herman Cain, who just won the straw poll in Florida. It's just part of history that I am uh, trying to bring out to make things, uh, to put things into perspective and into a frame of reference. Now, last night I told you that in my opinion and in, in my informed opinion, and, and what I'm thinking and the excitement that I have and how the word of God is burning in my bones and how my love for the Lord grows day by day. My love for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit growing day by day. And the fact that I can see but I will not report the amount of people who are beginning to listen to me. I can say the next pivot of the United States will move to the Rust Belt, which means the Midwest, Ohio, parts of Indiana, Pennsylvania, Michigan. It's going to happen. And this is from National News. Not from Dayton or Columbus. This is actually on the Business Journal. And here's the report. Ohio oil production will save the Rust Belt. What we're called the Rust Belt because we used to create cars and then uh, they rusted with all the salt. But we don't really create cars anymore. I went through Toledo and I went through Detroit and yeah, it's a Rust Belt all right. But here's the report. Ohio's oil production could be the savior of the Rust Belt. Why? Why has prosperity come to an area? Now, the reason why I'm saying this is not because I'm a, a, a narcissist. I know why prosperity goes from place to place. It follows a pivot. And why all of a sudden would there be prosperity in one area? Or the possibility of it. Because there's definitely the possibility a pivot will form right here. Not today. Not tomorrow. Not next year. I'm talking ten years from now. And that would be about the time they could get this all set up. Once we have uh, some uh, release of some regulations which, which could definitely occur. So the article goes on. The Buckeye State may become the largest oil producer. The Ohio Oil and Gas Association reports that the Ohio oil industry has already had major impact on the economy, $665 million in 2009. When you factor in the 
natural gas sector, it rises. And this is just talking about now before they made the large discovery. To date, there have been more than 268,000 wells drilled in Ohio, ranking the state as one of the most active in the nation. Nearly all of Ohio's oil production takes place on the eastern side of the state with most wells in Licking, Knox, uh, I don't know, it's an Indian name, uh, Cuyahoga, and Noble counties. They are just east of Franklin County where I live. And they've also found a shelf uh, in central uh, Ohio as well. The Utica Shell is a geological formation about a mile below the Earth's surface. That's not too far to find oil. Seems far to us to dig down a mile, but we're talking the oil is beneath our feet. We are walking on gold. The Utica Shell is a, a geologic formation about a mile below the Earth's surface and roughly Half of Ohio's counties, especially in the eastern part of the state, that could hold as much as 600 billion worth of oil and natural gas, according to the Lancaster Gazette. Apparently they are uh, some type of reporting agency for oil. For a presentation to the Ohio Oil and Gas Association last month, Larry Wickstrom, the state's geologist, said he estimates up to 15.7 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 5.5 billion barrels of oil could be recovered from Ohio's share of the Utica Shale. Shell is spelled at S-H-A-L-E if you want to look it up and see what that's all about. The association's most recent study of the state's oil industry showed during 2009, Ohio oil producers had 64,400 wells in operation. And this was before they made the discovery. And uh, let me, I'm not going to read all of it to you. Let me get to some of the main points here. Okay, let's move on here. It's talking about all the things that have already been produced, which is quite a bit. And it's showing they have a picture of money flowing into Ohio. I like that picture. Independent producers, like most of those in Ohio, including Atlas Energy, are developing America's oil and gas resource base, the association says. Independent producers drill 90% of domestic oil wells that produce 68% of America's crude oil. Where's most of the oil coming from? not Saudi Arabia, Ohio. And they're also talking about all the things that they're finding. Ohio also lays claim to the first discovery of oil from a drilled well in 1814. So Ohio is the first to find oil. That's something. A saltwater well driller discovered oil at a depth of 475 feet in Noble County, according to the association. Ohio's first commercial oil well was placed into production in 1860 in Washington County. Then it goes on to talk about domestic oil production and how we need it uh, and how uh, it's going to have to occur in order for any type of prosperity to occur. But again, the title says, Ohio oil production could save 
the Rust Belt. And that means, uh, you know, Ohio used to be a tremendous industrial center. I can still see the vestiges of that today by a lot of factories sitting around, some of which are closed, especially in Toledo. Holy cow. And Detroit, forget it. But that whole place can be revitalized. And we have the resources right here to do it. Now, whether that occurs or not depends on one thing. Will there be a pivot? Well, I just link up in my mind a few things. I'm going to teach Bible doctrine on a daily basis. And if you teach, they will come. Period. God will send them. If you teach, they'll come. If you teach Bible doctrine correctly, they will come. And it may not be that many, but they will come. And from some of the things that I've been uh, reading concerning this, and uh, some of the other things I've been reading concerning our nation, I'm starting to become more optimistic and maybe foolish optimis uh, optimism. But I've studied history for quite a while, and I've been wrong from time to time, but usually I'm right. Just ask my parents, who I say will be the next president, and uh, they'll say, yeah, most of the time he was right. Except when I was younger and I didn't know so much. I knew Barack Obama was president before any, well, the news people knew it, but I knew it. I went to bed way early that night, and I knew he was going to win. I told everybody, this guy's winning. And most people said, nah, nah, no, this, this guy's going to win. I, I, and I'm not trying to brag. It's, it's just something about people. I just know people and their emotionalism and how they can get wrapped up in words. And if you even hear some of the speeches from our president, and I'm not trying to disparage him, but when you hear some of the speeches in the past that he gave, they sounded good, a little fluffy. A little bit without uh, not much substance, but it sounded good. And he would say it in such a way that it would make people feel as if, I want to vote for that. That sounds wonderful. And you know, that's the way a lot of pastors are. And that's why so many people have itching ears, because they want to listen to something uplifting. Or they want to listen to something to at least to where they can be emotionally stimulated by someone's voice. And uh, it's something that can be easily done, but the Apostle Paul always avoided it. Now, Apollos had a personality to where he used his uh, very eloquent voice and he had a booming type voice so that people really liked his voice. But the Apostle Paul always said, I try to speak plainly because I want you to know what I'm talking about. And you could be a pastor teacher and you could come up with, uh, you could uh, change your style, change your personality and all for numbers and it's stupid. You don't need numbers. You need a lean, mean, spiritual machine. When I say mean, I don't really mean mean. You need a lean, grace-oriented spiritual machine. You don't need 5,000 people. Hell, you don't even need 500. What do you need? Two or more. And if you use a gimmick to bring people along, politicians use gimmicks and... Pastors today use gimmicks, and I will warn about pastors. I'm not going to stop warning about pastors. And uh, the reason why is because they are the ones who are leading people astray. And have you ever heard of the Apostle Paul talk about somebody called Demetrius the silversmith? I have, along with a few other people. Do you ever hear about the Apostle Paul chewing out Mark? Not my dad, but uh, Mark in the Bible. I have. G. 
you ever hear about the Apostle Paul chewing out another pastor named Peter, another apostle? I have. Why? Well, they need the most chewing out because sheep are dumb. And if a pastor is leading them astray, they bah right along with it. And when the Apostle Paul went up to Peter and said, you are wrong, Peter in humility changed course. Now, I don't know what's wrong with a lot of people out there. I receive emails from many different people, not so much lately, but in the past I've received emails where people trying to tell me what to do. People trying to tell me whether uh, what to do in my personal life. Now, I'm kind. When I'm behind the pulpit, I'm teaching. When, when I'm in person, I'm kind. And I, I, I let them give their opinion and then shake it off. But I'm going to tell you something. I know what I am talking about. Some of you have the idea because I'm 34 and you consider that young. I don't consider that young. I've lived a full life already as far as I'm concerned. I've lived about three lives compared to the stupid adultish lives a lot of people live. Where they sit down and watch soap operas for all day long. Or they sit down and watch uh, some sh a nonsense show. Nothing wrong with television. I like it too. But there's more to life than that. Principle, principle, principle. Living by principle. And I've been a believer since the age of five. And at the age of 13, I clicked on those positive signals. And I did not stop listening. And I am now 34. And I've heard about every tape possible. I'm sure there's a few I haven't heard. And I know there's some that I've forgotten but I have heard a tremendous amount of Bible doctrine. And you won't believe me, but I've heard four to seven to eight tapes a day. And you say, I heard the colonel say, if you do that, you're crazy. No, you're not. Because David said, I meditate on thy word both day and night. Now that's how you get ahead. And that's what I do. And when I receive criticism, it's sad on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's laughable. Because you don't know me. You get up and teach for an hour. You get up and put a sermon together. Well, let's continue now with verse 16. Acts chapter 2, 16. Well, let me see what time, how long I've been going on. Some of these I've just been giving you some conversations on life because it needs to be done. And then uh, we get to the doctrine in some verses. But uh, people have such, uh, today, due to arrogance, People have so many goofy ideas that you just have to sit down sometimes and just talk common sense. Now, in the next message, of course, we'll be getting to Acts chapter 2, verse 16. And what we will be studying is how, you know, Peter had always been chewed out. He'd been chewed out by God the Father. He'd been chewed out by God the Son. He'd been chewed out by the Apostle Paul. He'd been chewed out by quite a few people because he's the type of very gregarious personality and also highly impulsive and also had a little tinge of arrogance, but not so much so that he would not take reproof and correction from male pastors who were greater than him, not from a female. Not once did any female come up to Peter and tell him what to do. Neither did it happen to Paul. 
Neither did it happen to anyone except our Lord Jesus Christ. Some ninny came up and thought she was going to put one over on him, and he straightened her out in a hurry. And when you look at it in Aramaic, or as it comes out in the Greek, he shouts, and it's made very clear that he shouts because uh, she's talking about the feminist movement and how blessed is blessed are you because you sucked on your mom's tit. That's basically what she said. And he looked at her and shut her up in a New York second with his loud, booming voice, and he said, "Wrong." One thing that I learn as I teach and grow spiritually and continue to teach Bible doctrine is the fact that you cannot back down ever. And you cannot get to the point to where you want to win a popularity contest because you're not. You might win an unpopularity contest, but you're not going to win a popularity contest. And that is not the point. We go back to motivation, proper motivation. And I'll be doing another one in a moment. But just before I close, I just want to let you know my motivation is pure. And you can't, and if you have an accusation, bring it against me. Talk to me about it. Because my motivation is completely pure. I don't ask for money. In fact, I avoid the issue altogether. I just want people to grow in grace and in knowledge, and I want some believers in the United States to grow a backbone, and I want some people to get back to some common sense, which comes from Bible doctrine. You might say, I was so bored about all that stuff you said about Herman Cain. You wouldn't be so bored if you had some knowledge of divine establishment principles. Nothing bores me, except, uh, well, I guess there could be something that could bore me, but I don't get bored because if it looks like it's going to bore me, I go do something else. I'm trying to think of something that has bored me before. I'm having a hard time thinking of it. I even enjoy driving, traveling for hours and hours. It doesn't bother me. I enjoy sitting down and listening to nothing. No TV, lights out. Just sitting in the chair, very comfortable chair. Thinking about things or what you may call meditating or praying. I love life. I'm very happy. And the more you grow in grace and knowledge, the more you'll get to that point of having happiness. Now, it's not always that way. I'm a sinner. I slip up. So do you. And I'm gracious because I know I slip up and I know you slip up. And that's the way it should be among royal family of God. We're all on the same team. Why is everybody bickering at each other? Well, even though we are all royal family of God, we have a lot of issues in the United States culturally that need to be dealt with. And there are a lot of issues individually that need to be dealt with personally between you and the Lord and for me, between me and the Lord. It's not my business what you do. Some people want to run up and tell me what they've done, and they have, and they don't embarrass me, and obviously they're not embarrassed. But the answer is always clear, rebound. 
And the only reason someone runs around telling somebody something is because they're trying to alleviate a guilt complex when all you had to do was rebound. I've heard about some depraved things. I wasn't shocked. And uh, I would hear about these depraved things and then find out they'd already rebounded about it. Well, you're going to have to rebound again for guilt. All those sins were judged on the cross. And I've committed very gross sins, and so have you. I still commit sins. I'm not proud of it. I have an old sin nature. Now what we're going to find out in the next lesson is we have Peter here. Timid Peter in the past. He's going to turn into a fireball of Bible doctrine. And why? The filling of God the Holy Spirit. Now it's 1.35 a.m. Eastern Time, so I guess I'll shut it down now for a little while. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten those who have listened and who have been interested so that they might come to understand that, yes, we are all royal family of God. We all are on the same team. Personality is not an issue. That we have to grow in grace and in knowledge. And we have to follow the mechanics of rebound and keep moving. Of the two power options, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, plus Operation Z. Of the three spiritual mechanics of the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, plus Operation Z, plus the ten problem-solving devices, which include rebound, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, the faith rest drill in four categories, grace and doctrinal orientation, a personal sense of destiny, personal love for God, and personal love for mankind, uh, plus H, sharing the happiness of God in occupation with Christ. You put those three together and you have the three spiritual mechanics and you're on your way to having a stable and happy life no matter how long or how short you live. Because I can tell you right now I'm 34 and I feel as if I've lived a very long life. Sometimes I think I'm an old man and that's because of the fact that uh, I hang around uh, at work, some people my age, and uh, the difference is stark, and it will always be stark. But I'm friendly, nice, and gracious. Now, I'm going to be teaching daily from now on. I've said it before, and you say, ah, oh, you'll quit. No, I won't. I have a motivation, a fire in my bones. There's some things happening. As a student of history, I can see some things happening. The earth is rumbling. And not because of me, but because there could be very well a revival just around the corner. A revival for unbelievers and a revival for believers getting back to the word of God. And when that occurs, and when those believers go back to the word of God and learn rebound and get that arrogance kicked out of their soul, that garbage, we all have some, kick that arrogant garbage out of your soul. Stop thinking you know what's going on and that you need to instruct and, and that you know everything that needs to be done when you might not know much of anything. You're free to have an opinion about whomever you want to have an opinion. But I'll guarantee you this. You keep it to yourself. And if you've been listening to a pastor and you suddenly have a change of mind, keep it to yourself. You don't have to be rude. You don't have to try to be bossy. 
walk away quietly. That's grace. I'm all for grace. And uh, people come and go, and it's sad to pe- see people go because... Right here is where the pivot's going to be. It's going to move from Texas. Not that people will move from Texas, but the pivot is moving to right here in the Midwest. And within uh, 10 years, it will be evident, maybe even sooner. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning what we've noted. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.